I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, session um, on Mahara and a brief intro session to the um, ePortfolio software, um, but not really so much to the software itself, but what you can do with Mahara and um, why, why it was created and what people around the world are doing with it and why we need it in our learning ecosystem. So I'm Christina Hoppner and I'm the project lead of Mahara, the, the open source project. Um, and I'm employed by Catalyst uh, IT in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And we work with a lot of different applications and Mahara is one of those. Um, you can find us in a few countries, um, primarily in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand and Australia. Um, I'm based in Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington, but we also have offices in Auckland and Christchurch, as well across the Tasman in Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne. And some of you might know that we are also having offices in Brighton and Dublin. And the latest one is in Canada. They don't quite yet have a city because the colleague who was uh, to move there hasn't yet due to the pandemic. Um, that's why we don't quite have a location, but it is somewhere around where, where it is indicated. Um, at and I joined Catalyst actually a little over 11 years ago, coming from the University of Luxembourg, um, but originally from Germany. And um, having had the chance to then start working with the development team here at Catalyst, working on the software project itself and also supporting educators um, domestically as well as internationally and working with uh, many of you for, for many, many years already in the community and listening to what you do with Mahara, what could be done better, what works really well already and um, hearing what um, everybody is doing with the software. So it's really good to see a number of um, good friends and also new faces and names here in the session. Mahara is actually celebrating its 15th anniversary this year. Um, it was started as a project by a number of universities and um, polytechnics here in Aotearoa, New Zealand uh, 15 years ago in 2006 and um, was created as a personal learning environment complementary to learning management systems um, where it then was possible for uh, students to keep their own learning evidence and also create portfolios um, so that they can also determine their learning journey. And 15 years later, we are still here and supporting organizations around the world, um, releasing two versions of Mahara every single year in which there's a number of new features available and um, ways to work with portfolios that hopefully cover a lot of scenarios that you are encountering at your organizations. So what I'd like to do today is kind of go into just a little bit of detail for some of the ways in which Mahara can be used in organizations, um, show you also a couple of examples that you can then explore further, and um, then also just um, show you why we are creating portfolios and also then share a number of resources with you that are available for free. So if you imagine we have a learner and um, at an organization oftentimes uh, people of course have different requirements on their portfolio. And therefore, it um, is good when a portfolio platform can support many, many different scenarios so that you do not have to um, purchase or support yourself or um, have commissioned um, different tools for to cover of every single of those scenarios, but where you can use one platform that can be used for many. And so Mahara is one of those flexible um, portfolio solutions that allows you to create different types of portfolios. And today I would like to highlight uh, five of those. 
The first one is the learning portfolio. That is really geared towards the learning process and looking at what a student has done, what they might want to do in the future and also focused on the reflection um, aspect. There's also um, the assessment portfolio that has come up quite a bit, um, has gained on popularity quite a bit over the last few years um, so that students create portfolios not just for themselves and their own reflection but also to receive a grade for a particular course or paper um, dep or unit depending on where you are in the world. Um, also over the last probably about three, four years, we've seen an increase in usage of portfolios for work integrated learning. So think your uh, practicum, internship, externship, um, all the things that students do away from um, the tertiary institution in a company or in a social service where they t um, practice their skills and practice what they are studying. And the work integrated learning portfolio is really, really nice one because it allows the institution to stay in touch with the student while they are away at um, uh, and in the workplace, yet also still be able to engage with them. What we had seen um, here in Aotearoa with one, uh, with one university is that um, some of their students worked internationally and um, because they of course could not come back or participate in face-to-face uh, -face, uh, sessions, they created their portfolio and stayed in touch with their lecturers that way for the most part of their um, overseas experience. A very common case of portfolios is also the showcase portfolio. Um, that is primarily th there to say how well you have been doing, what are you really, really good at, and is being used quite a bit for employability purposes, either to get an internship or to get a job afterwards. And last but not least, um, I do want to call out a type of portfolio that we are seeing increasingly, and that is the professional certification or professional registration portfolio. Those portfolios um, are always found directly in the workplace and typically follow a competency framework. So they could also be called competency portfolios and might be called that at your organization. And uh, they usually follow a strict way of um, evidencing experiences because they lead towards a particular certification. Let's think about nurses or teachers or pharmacists or doctors that uh, do need to re-register on a regular basis in order to continue practicing. And so while these five different types of portfolios can stand on their own and have distinguishing, distinguishing factors, typically um, the boundaries are not as clear cut. So an assessment portfolio, for example, can contain traces of a learning portfolio or a work integrated learning portfolio could be also be used for uh, summative assessment purposes. And of course, a professional certification portfolio resembles in a lot of ways also an assessment portfolio because at the end, an assessment is being made um, about the skills of a person and whether they can continue practicing or not. And um, uh, the, the other thing is also that in Mahara, for example, when you set up a portfolio for one of those five purposes, you can repurpose the evidence or some of the evidence that you put into the portfolio in another one. Um, making it very easy to pull out parts from one portfolio, have them also available in another, and therefore serve different audiences and different purposes of the portfolio, yet still be in the same pool of information. So you could have a learning portfolio, for example, that is more focused on the, on the process and on the reflection, However, you might still use some of the visuals or a video that you created 
in a showcase portfolio. And so I'd be interested to learn from you what if you are already using portfolios and if you do, um, what type of portfolios either you have created yourself or that are being created at your organization and that you support. So please feel free to put that into the chat and uh, let us know. I know some of you have been using portfolios already for quite a while and might need a little bit of time to type their answer into the chat um, because there are so many different uh, possibilities. And of course, if, um, if you don't yet use portfolios, that uh, doesn't matter either. We are, we are here to learn and um, maybe by the end of the session you, you also made a new contact with whom you want to get in touch afterwards to see um, how they are using portfolios at their organization. Okay, so while, while you might still be typing, um, and oh, one, one example is reflecting competency portfolio and showcase portfolio. And often what we find is it does depend on the discipline, um, what type of portfolio is being used. And sometimes also whether students are in their first, second, third or fourth year, or what sort of degree they are studying for that, that can al always determine what sort of portfolio is being used. Now let's take a look at uh, some examples and um, you will have access to the slides uh, once I sent you the link also with the recording. Um, so don't fear that um, you have to type all the URLs. Um, you will get those either tomorrow or over the weekend. And I just like to spend a couple of minutes on some of the examples that, that are sending out to me and are really nice representations of what can be done with portfolios in general and with Mahara in particular. So in this case, um, this is a portfolio that, that I always really, really like uh, going back to because Teresa McKinnon from Warwick University exemplifies the portfolio language incredibly well in her professional certification portfolio. So this is her portfolio to uh, stay and remain a, an, a certified member of the Association of Learning Technologists and even already in this very short text that you see here on screen and you're not expected to read um, any of that text right now um, she uses certain phrases that really give us that indication that she is creating a portfolio so one of the things that she says is a highlight of my professional career that tells me immediately that she is curating her learning evidence. She doesn't just dump everything to us what she had done over the last three or five years or even throughout her, her entire career. She consciously selects what is important for this particular portfolio here. And if she were to create um, a showcase portfolio, she might repurpose this uh, exact same example and not show something else. Whereas if she has a learning portfolio, she might then um, add another story to it and say what had come before and what had come after. And she also pinpoints and reflects back on why certain experiences were important to her in her career. The point at which I realized and that is a very important um, part of the e-portfolio process that we are not just recounting what has happened in a way of a summary, but also making sense of it, reflecting on the experience and um, putting it in that learning uh, context. And she revisited um, 
each of the sections of her, her original submission in order to complete that review. So again, the looking back in order to learn from those experiences, maybe even see what she had done differently since, and uh, therefore looking forward how she wants to do things in the future. But of course, learning oftentimes is not a process that we are just doing on our own um, in, in a room without anybody there. But learning usually happens um, with others. And so she had received feedback and mentoring over the years, which have been helpful to her to progress in her learning and how she sees certain situations or certain parts of her career. And that also is an aspect that is facilitated in Mahara because um, people can't just look at your portfolio. Um, they can also comment on it and comment either directly on the portfolio overall or on individual parts of the portfolio, such as images or videos or any other file types. And so even within that very short example, you can see the language that is coming out for uh, working with a portfolio, especially here for that certification portfolio, where she does need to sh um, showcase that meta level and also that reflection level. Another example that I wanted to show you is uh, this one here from Priyana Edibles. Um, she's a bachelor's student at Monash University over in Australia, and she created a whole bunch of portfolios for her media classes as assessment. And while these portfolios have been assessment portfolios, she still put in her personal touch by applying a skin um, and also by putting pictures in some of the pictures in her portfolio she's taking herself. Um, she's also a, a fantastic graphic designer so that she incorporates her own uh, graphical representations that she's created in her portfolio. And, um, what you can where you can learn more from Priyana is actually through an interview that um, I did with her in July this year for the ABLE conference. And there she tells us a little bit about her journey, how she got to portfolios, what she is doing in the portfolios. And you can also access um, more of her portfolio work. Um, there on this page, you see a few other student interviews, um, Ruby Cuny, Imani Samihan, and also Samantha Hellos, um, all the way at the bottom. Um, they are also all using Mahara. Um, Iman, Ruby, and Sam are using Mahara at Dublin City University, which has a rich history of working in, with portfolios for different purposes. And um, they all account for the uh, experience as students, how they got there, what they get out of the portfolio, why they continue working with their portfolios, and also giving advice to other students of um, what they would say should be done when somebody is new to a portfolio. So I highly recommend you check out not just the um, interviews uh, for students that are using Mahara, but also all the others that are on that uh, page because we collected interviews from a number of diff different students work um, creating portfolios for different purposes and also being at different stages in their university career. And I did put this link already in the chat if you want to get to that and maybe listen to that um, on your way home from the office or in a lunch break. Now, what we have seen over the last few years is also that um, portfolios do get created increasingly for competency, certification and assessment purposes. And of course, in that um, often there, there is a structure prescribed to students, or at least a fundamental um, area given for students so that they know what is expected of them. And Mahara can help with that. And we've worked on over the last years to increase those possibilities of making it easier to scaffold the portfolio creation process and not just have this empty page in front of students and they don't know what they could do there. 
And so one way of how you can scaffold the portfolio ex creation experience is by directly adding instructions to a portfolio page so that both the students and also the viewers of the portfolio can see um, what is expected on that page, what is the learner supposed to do. Um, while I do very much like working with templates, um, I'm not a huge fan of creating templates that are too prescriptive. And that is where our placeholder text come into, um, into play very nicely, because you can put a placeholder on a page, just give it a heading, but don't yet decide for the, stu for the student what type of artifact is expected there so that when the student receives a copy or copies the portfolio themselves, they can decide whether they want to put text there, whether they want to include a journal entry, an entire journal, um, whether they want to have an image gallery, a PDF, and so on there. And um, that is functionality that was, um, that, that, was a, that came out of um, research at Dublin City University and um, a usability improvement that we discussed a few years ago in order to see, well, how can we scaffold the template creation or portfolio creation in general, um, but not make it too prescriptive. And um, the nice thing there is that you cut down on a lot of instructions because in the past what needed to happen is that you had a little text box that said, if you, here is what you have to do. And if you don't want to use a text box, you can delete it and then you can put an image block or a different file block onto the page. So that is a lot of writing. Whereas now you can kind of have all of that in the instructions and then the blocks are there just with a heading so that students can then decide on their own how they want to represent their learning experience. And in some cases, currently only on the text block, it is possible to um, also have instructions specifically for that part. Um, so if you do want some extra text in there, then you can also prepare that with instructions. So those were just a few brief examples of what you can do with Mahara. Um, we are not, this, this is not a hands-on session, so we are not going into details of how you build your pages, how you uh, can set up a competency portfolio so that on the fr uh, front page of it, you can see very easily um, which competencies have already been achieved and which ones are still outstanding, or how you're tracking um, against verification of our review of a portfolio. Um, but what I wanted to show you is that richness of the, the different types of portfolios that can be created, either like in this example here on screen that you have a very scaffolded um, approach, take people on hand, um, show them what they can do, which works really well for, for busy professionals. Um, we are often also the design aspect, so things that we've seen on Priyana's portfolio um, do not play such a role, but where it goes more towards the, the content um, for nurses, um, what they can do. Whereas, of course, in, in a design portfolio or also in a digital media portfolio, the, the creation and the use of graphical elements is important and therefore also in an assessment um, or evaluation and um, that then has different criteria attached. And in Teresa's example, we have seen the language of the portfolio really, really well. Um, not just summarizing of experiences, but using a reflective uh, method and um, really bringing that uh, element out. Now that kind of leads us to, well, what do we call that when we work with portfolios? And um, there, I really, really like the uh, concept of folio thinking, which uh, was originated and th um, thought up by Helen Chen at Stanford University. Um, here I'm using Vicky Suter's definition that she has on her blog, because I find it 
it really exemplifies nicely and in a very condensed way of uh, what folio thinking is. And so it is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection and connection that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely, i.e. tell stories about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value and how the experiences relate one to each other. And so you can already see from the highlights kind of the words that are important to me in that definition. And these are the collection, organization, reflection, connection, tell stories and relationships. And so really what we are trying to do with a portfolio is to tell our story, our learning story. And that often does include um, personal accounts and not just a summary of um, events that have happened. And with the portfolio, you collect and you organize and you reflect um, and make connections between the different um, experiences and not just zip them next to each other. That's why kind of a live stream is not necessarily most of the time a portfolio because it is just a series of disconnected events. Um, whereas in a Mahara portfolio, if you create a portfolio page or also a collection, you can link different artifacts to each other because you're showing them in that particular context. And then if you repurpose those um, elements in a different portfolio, they might be organized differently and therefore tell a different story. And so now what does it boil down to for us in Mahara? Um, for me, there are kind of five activities the, the main ones, especially kind of looking in particular at that portfolio aspect. And in English, luckily, they all start with a C, so they are easily remembered as the five C's. And so in Mahara, you can actually create your learning evidence, um, meaning that you can write text um, and then add that to a portfolio page and that can be primary evidence um, or write a journal entry. Um, but typically kind of in portfolios that creation of the learning evidence is kept out because we already have the learning evidence before it comes to the portfolio. And we typically start with the collection of uh, the evidence. So collecting means in this case that we either upload something or that we embed a video or any other um, content from social media that either we have created or that is part of a learning experience. And um, that though is not really enough for a portfolio because um, if you were just to collect, then we haven't made those connections between the different pieces of learning evidence. And that is where the curation comes in, which then means the organization of that evidence uh, and also the reflection on it and making sense of all the things that we have collected. Then what we can also do in Mahara is have conversations with people. We can converse with them on the evidence, on the portfolios themselves and bring those comments into our learning experience and make them part of that, make them part of the conversation, learning conversation that we are having and um, also how we might want to proceed in the future. And as I mentioned earlier, um, learning does not happen on its own. So in Mahara, it is actually possible that you can connect with people also in groups and create group portfolios or use the groups to discuss topics, to exchange opinions, to, to exchange files and um, therefore create something together. And so that has been used quite successfully, actually at Shrock. So um, Ali is not here anymore, um, but if, uh, Kathy, if you happen to have the link to one of your case studies handy, please do feel free to pop it into the chat um, because yeah, I know that um, Shok had been using portfolios quite really, really well also in groups for projects where students received templates and then put them into, into groups and uh, worked on them together to fill them in. 
Now, if you're looking for a, um, for a metaphor on how to work with portfolios, there are many around that uh, you could use. And um, Kathy, no problem. What I'll do is I'll see that I'll actually add that example in into the slide deck before I send it out so that um, if it is still online that everybody can take a look at it. Now, a metaphor usually works best if people can relate to it. And so there, there are many, many out there. Um, I know that people have been using a fridge or a wardrobe um, or also a theater, so backstage and front of stage. In this case here, I'd um, briefly like to outline how Mahara could be related to a museum or, or also art gallery. And this graphic and the idea of using the portfolio as a um, look at a portfolio as a museum um, was inspired by Mandy Mentes at Messi University, who has been using the metaphor of a portfolio as an art gallery very successfully with her students throughout the years, introducing them to portfolio work. So if you're looking at the bottom, we've got the curator um, running around in the archives, organizing everything, collect, collecting everything, organizing things, um, putting things together in, uh, into their distinct areas and getting ready for an exhibition. And when an exhibition is being organized, it hardly ever happens that all the artifacts that a museum has will be on display because typically they have way more than would fit into the available space. So what does the curator? Well, the curator selects the pieces that fit the theme of the exhibition as perfectly as possible. So they go into the archive and pull pieces out. So they curate the, the collection. Um, and then often we find a description about the exhibit, what the focus is, the artists or artists um, in the exhibition hall in order to get a sense of how we can view the evidence, uh, view the artifacts and what story is being told. And then for the individual artifacts themselves, we have short descriptions about them depending on how the um, exhibit is made up, but sometimes just very factual and sometimes there might also be little stories in there. And so one of those rooms um, can be regarded as a portfolio because you curate what goes in there and how the individual elements um, of the portfolio relate one to another. Now, in the next room, it could very well be that the exhibit continues. So in Mahara speak, you would have two pages um, that are then put together in a collection and can be viewed together. You have a pathway from one to another. You know that those two work together and you can look at them um, together. Now, sometimes in a museum you have special exhibits. So for those you can't just go in, but you might need to pay a little bit of money to, to see them. And so in Mahara, we can also restrict the access to certain portfolios um, by make, keeping them private or by only giving certain people access to, to the portfolio. And like in any museum, when there's a change of exhibitions, um, before the new exhibition is being open to the public, it is closed and not available to anybody. And that means in Mahara speak that everything that you create is private at first. So nobody has access until you um, explicitly give them access to your portfolio. And then lastly, a museum is not just there to hang the art on the wall or to put um, sculptures out and so on, but it's there for people to look at the art. And that is when um, student groups come in or individuals and uh, walk through the, through the exhibits, uh, read the text or view installations, learn about the artists, learn about the art itself, and then um, can also engage with it either by leaving feedback or there might be interactive displays and all of that can also be replicated in the portfolio because you decide who can have access to your portfolios whether it is the entire public or only people who have access to the instance or who are in a specific group and you can invite feedback um, from everybody. 
So this is a metaphor that that I quite like to to think of when when trying to explain a portfolio because we bring the familiar to to a theoretical concept. Um, but of course, the museum or art gallery metaphor might not work for everybody. So I would like to encourage you to find your own metaphor that works for your students. And maybe that is a different metaphor, depending on whether you support students in education versus uh, veterinary medicine versus sports science. And so find the language that speaks to the students. And to give you, um, before we finish, a few um, resources on hand that can help you get started with portfolios if you haven't already, um, or for those that have already been using portfolios for a while, there, there might be some resources in here that um, you haven't seen yet. I highly recommend those five here. The first one is a really quick activity from Sam Taylor, a colleague of mine um, in our UK um, sister company. And she created a Mahara page called Designing Effective ePortfolio Activities, which gives you a very nice introduction and small tasks to, to get started. Lisa Donaldson from Dublin City University created an ebook, uh, e portfolio based assessment, that um, showcases how different organizations, in particular in the UK and Ireland, use e portfolios. That is not um, they are not necessarily all using Mahara, so it is really more around the pedagogical implications and the scenarios that are being used and then which technology you use depends on what you have available and then you can transfer um, those concepts in. A Meteor publication but also still free is the Field Guide to ePortfolio. Um, that is a publication by AECNU and um, was supported by ABLE, the Association for Authentic Experiential and Evidence-Based Learning in the United States. And uh, the field guide really has, um, has 12 short chapters um, because they are meant to be kind of really an introduction to the topic and in a way an executive summary for them. But there are lots and lots of resources available for each chapter so that um, they, it is quite the read. Um, but gives you a good overview of what you might want to consider when you're starting an ePortfolio project at your organization. Or if you need some arguments to convince certain um, people either in management or administration or the head of school why you want to continue with your portfolio initiative, why you should be starting one, or why altogether you really want to discuss that. And uh, we also have um, a particular publication on the learning portfolio, the learning portfolio in higher education, a game of snakes and ladders, also by Dublin City University, like the ePortfolio based assessment, which is a very nice read and um, also literature review of learning portfolios. And last but not least, um, the most recent publication or online body of work is the Digital Ethics Principles in ePortfolios. That is an initiative by ABLE, um, now already in its third year as of last month. And um, two years ago, we established 10 principles. And this year, another three came on board. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and decolonization. Um, the visibility of labor and also evaluation kind of meet here concepts, therefore three versus 10 um, in the different years. And um, they, there we have a number of strategies, resources, as well as examples of how digital ethics can be implemented in portfolio work or should be considered when creating portfolios. So all of these resources are freely available and I recommend um, checking them out, putting them onto your reading list. And they are, most of them are really, really short reads. So um, you can consume them, them in batches and don't have to read them kind of continuously because they are very much uh, self-contained. 
And if you are already using Mahara or Saber, I would actually like to learn a bit more about the new features that are coming up in the version of Mahara that we are going to release tomorrow, Friday the 29th of October, then I'd like to invite you, if you haven't already signed up, for the webinars next week on the uh, new features of Mahara 21.10, where I'll be showing them in a little bit more detail than in the feature video that you'll have available tomorrow. And so look forward to seeing some of you there. And now we still have um, almost 15 minutes time for any of your questions or comments. So please do feel free if you have the possibility to use a microphone to turn on your microphone and speak and ask your questions um, or use the chat for that. And I will be turning off the recording though.